Hi, good morning. I'm Jillian Galley. I'm the project director of the Digital Archaeological Archive of Comparative Slavery, which is an archaeological research project based at Monica Valley. I'm the project. Uh, the project is based at Monticello, and we collaborate with archaeologists across North America and the Caribbean. Uh, we have a website through which we deliver archaeological data related to sites of enslavement across Maryland, Virginia, South Carolina, and multiple countries in the Caribbean. Today, I am delighted to welcome four scholars that we collaborate with on their work in St. Croix. Dr. Ayana Omalade Fluellen, Dr. Alexandra Jones, Dr. William White, and Ms. Gabrielle Miller will be joining us to talk about their individual projects and the way they collaborate as scholars through the Society of Black Archaeologists and the St. Croix Archaeological Society. Um, we're going to start with Dr. Ayana Fluellen, and she is a Black feminist, an archaeologist, a storyteller, and an artist. She's the co-founder and current president-elect of the Society of Black Archaeologists and sits on the board of Diving with a Purpose. She received her PhD from the University of Texas, Austin, and is currently an assistant professor in the Department of Anthropology at the University of California, Riverside. Her research and teaching interests address black feminist, black feminist theory, historical archaeology, maritime heritage conservation, and public and community engaged archaeology. She has been featured in National Geographic, Science Magazine, and on PBS, and regularly presents her work at institutions including the National Museum for Women in the Arts. Dr. Fluellen, take it away. My apologies, I didn't realize I was on mute. Thank you so much, Jillian, and thank you to the Montel Foundation for the opportunity to share the collaborative work unfolding between DAX and the Society of Black Gallus on the island of St. Croix. Next slide, please. To start off this discussion, I want to place this presentation in historical context that structures why there is a need for the and why our collaboration with DAX is so important. Today, the exact number of African Americans employed as archaeologists in America is unknown. And our best estimates can be gleaned from the three needs assessments conducted by the Society of American Archaeology since 2003, which you can see here on the slide. Using this data as, using this data as a proxy, the percentage of people who identify as African American has remained at less than 1% of the total number of American archaeologists growing at a slow pace of 0.1% every five years. With that in mind, I point us to the piece co-authored by myself, Dr. Justin Donovan, Alicia Odewale, Alexander Jones, Sion Wolde, Michael, Zoe Crossland, and Maria Franklin, titled The Future of Archaeology is Anti-Racist. And in this piece, we point to how permutations of racism, specifically anti-Black racism, inherent in the field of archaeology, contribute to the lack of racial diversity among professional archaeologists. Next slide, please. With the little time that I do have, I won't dive deep into the myriad of ways that systemic institutional racism can be combated in our personal lives and at every level of our professional lives. I invite you to look up the webinar, Archaeology in the Time of Black Lives Matter, for a deeper dive. Instead, I'd like to draw our attention to the Estate Little Princess Archaeology Project, a flagship program of the Society of Black Archaeologists that provides mentorship opportunities to undergraduate and graduate students, creating a pipeline for more African Americans to have access to the field and flourish once inside. The Society of Black Archaeologists, SBA for short, was founded in 2011 and became a nonprofit organization in 2018. <clears throat> Our mission centers on the histories and material cultures of global Black and African communities in archaeological research. By providing a strong network, mentorship, and educational access, the SBA works to resolve the ongoing systemic exclusion of Black and African scholars and communities from the field of archaeology. 
The SBA aims to provide avenues of engagement and training that will prepare Black and African scholars and communities to be active participants in the documentation, excavation, preservation, and interpretation of Black and African heritage. Next slide, please. The Estate Little Princess Project is SBA's mission and praxis. The genesis of the Estate Little Princess Archaeology Project began in 2015. Representatives of Diving with a Purpose, a community-focused organization dedicated to the conservation and protection of submerged heritage resources, contacted the Society of Black Archaeologists regarding a possible collaboration with the Slave Rex Project to facilitate a maritime and terrestrial archaeology program for Carusian youth. After a year of planning and several assessment trips to St. Croix, a joint maritime and terrestrial archaeology field school was established. And since 2014, the Slave Rocks Project organizers have been building partnerships in the community to set up potential projects on island. In 2016, before any shovels broke the ground or a permit to excavate was, say, was signed, Community meetings hosted by the Slave Rex Project were held with museum officials, local organizations, community stakeholders, the National Park Service, and archeologists from the Society of Black Archeologists. These meetings were held to assess the needs of the community, specifically around cultural heritage resources. A number of projects have come into fruition on St. Croix under the umbrella of the Slave Rex Project, and one of which is this collaboration with SBA on the project, the Estate Little Princess Archeology. span project. Next slide, please. And this slide really shows all the organizations that have come to make this project what it is, including the Caribbean Center for Boys and Girls, the University of the Virgin Islands Caribbean Culture Center, the Society of Black Archaeologists, and we'll hear later from Dr. Alexander Jones about the fantastic work that archaeology and the community is doing on the island as well as Junior Scientists in the Sea, the Carusian Heritage and Nature Tourism Organization, Diving with a Purpose, the National Museum of African American History and Culture, and the University of California's Historically Black College and University Initiative, as well as the National Park Service. So a lot of folks have come together to really make this project what it is. Next slide. And the core team that makes everything possible includes myself, um, Justin Donovan. So you can just click maybe like five times to show the team members. Thanks so much. Justin, Dr. Justin Dunavant, Dr. Alicia Odawale, Dr. William White, and Dr. Alexander Jones, who we'll hear from later. Next slide. The Estate Little Princess was established by, so just to give a brief history of the estate itself, it was established by the Danish governor, Frederick Moth, in 1749 to operate primarily as a sugar plantation. Over the years, the plantation estate expanded to accommodate a growing enslaved population, and new structures were added as the production of sugar and rum shifted from wind to steam production. As with other plantations and historic buildings on the island, many of the structures were fashioned with a combination of lime and coral tabby excavated from the nearby sea floor. While the extent of which coral mining occurred is not yet quantified, Dr. Dustin Donovan is doing a lot of that research, there is a clear connection between the environmental degradation that occurred on the island, on land, and underwater. And sugar remained the primary commodity, but the ground provisions were also, um, ground provisions were also cultivated to varying degrees at the estate Little Princess. And at its height in 1771, the estate accounted for 141 enslaved individuals and encompassed 200 acres of land. And this is actually one of the smaller estates, um, sugar plantations on the island of St. Croix during that time period. Next slide. So our research at the site really focuses on the lives of the enslaved and later free afro carusians that lived and labored at the estate Little Princess. And the image I have here are courtesy of Camille Staples and are of afro carusians at the estate at the turn of the 20th century. And through a multi-scale analysis of household, community, and society, we ask how afro carusians from slavery through freedom, so 1754 through 1917, interacted with their natural and cultural environment um, as processes of self-making. And we'd be more than welcome to answer any questions that audience members have specifically about our research. Next slide. And while I could spend a lot of time focusing on the excavations at the site, I instead want to actually pivot and discuss our education and mentorship opportunities and the ongoing work that we're doing with the Digital Archaeological Archive of Comparative Slavery. So we host two educational programs through this project. 
A little later, once again, we'll hear from Dr. Alexander Jones about the fantastic work with our youth archaeology program that's in partnership with archaeology in the community. But in addition to our youth training program, since 2018, we've had an ongoing partnership with the University of California's HBC, HBCU initiative, so Historically Black College and University initiative, that provides internship opportunities to undergraduate students from HBCUs to partake in a five-week field school at the site. And they get a, a deep dive into archaeological research, excavating beside us, doing the sort of rough work around sorting as well as an introduction to um, cataloging and analysis. And in addition to all of that, students receive a $3,000 stipend. They have their graduate applications waived to any University of California school. They're guaranteed four to five years of graduate funding upon acceptance into a UC system school. And currently we have one student who came through this project and has started her PhD in the anthropology department at UCLA, while another is starting a PhD program at Northwestern University in the history department, building on a project around the transatlantic slave trade that was formed during their internship time with us. Next slide, please. And artifacts excavated from the site are currently being housed at the University of Tulsa with plans to relocate them to the University of California Riverside for further analysis until a storage facility is built on island to house them. And this is really where our work with our, um, with our DAX partners comes in full swing. So artifact analysis is being conducted in partnership with DAX. And as Jillian mentioned, DAX hosts a digital relational database of excavation and artifact information that can be queried online, making archeological data on the African diaspora more widely accessible. And using the DAX database guarantees that material culture recovered from the estate little princess is cataloged and analyzed systematically to allow for intra-site as well as cross-site comparative analyses to the over 70 sites hosted on the DAX website. It also ensures that the, arche the archeological work that we're producing is more publicly accessible. Next slide. And since 2018, the Estate Little Princess Archaeology Project team members have participated in DAX workshops, really standardizing our analysis of artifacts such as glass, ceramics, and small finds from the site. And these are just images of myself, along with Dr. Justin Dunavant and one of the other speakers today, Ms. Gabrielle Miller, working with artifacts from the Estate Little Princess in the DAX lab at Monticello. And this is ongoing work. I'm going to hand it on over to Alexander Jones to share more about the work archaeology in the community is doing on island. Thank you. Excellent. Thanks, Ayana. Uh, I'm delighted to welcome Dr. Alex Jones. She's the founder and CEO of Archaeology in the Community, an education leader, and she's an education leader focused on community outreach and service. Dr. Jones has been an educator for more than 16 years. She's taught in multiple educational environments from primary schools to museums. She received her PhD in historical archeology span from the University of California at Berkeley. She's currently an assistant professor of archeology span at Goucher College in Maryland. Dr. Jones serves on the Dis District of Columbia's Historic Preservation Review Board, Board of Directors for the Society of Black Archaeologists, the Board of Directors for the St. Croix Archaeological Society, and is an academic trustee for the Archaeological Institute of America. Thanks, Alex. Look forward to hearing. If we could go ahead and uh, share the slides, we can start it. All right, so um, Ayana did a wonderful job of introducing the overall project. What I'm going to actually focus on is the work with the students in St. Croix. So for four years, the ellipse, which is our acronym <laughs> for the Estate Little Princess uh, project, um, has run a youth field school. So specifically, this field school has been run in partnership with the Caribbean Center for Boys and Girls on Island. We work with them to uh, identify and locate students each summer. And since its inception, we've already trained 45 students in archaeology and how to conduct um, archaeological method as well as, well as analysis. 
So in addition to just doing this, one of the things is um, we're very committed to uh, community archaeology and incorporating the community in every aspect of the work that we're doing. So one of the things that has come to fruition out of this project was that uh, community members identified it's great to train students, but kind of what else? What else are we going to give back? So in the course of this, um, I basically uh, pulled together the idea of creating paid internships. So each year, students who participate in the uh, field school have the opportunity to come back and then be paid interns where they assist. They continue their education in archaeology, but they also help the new generation of students that are being trained. And one of the benefits is uh, they're learning new archaeological skills each summer. So it's not like you're just coming back and doing the same thing of just excavating, but I'm bringing in new methods, new techniques. So by the time um, the interns actually graduate and eventually go off to college, they have not just the basic skills of going to a field school and knowing how to excavate, but they also have uh, various other uh, analytical um, skills as well. So in the past two years or three years now, because we have to consider our COVID year, uh, four former students have come back as paid interns. Um, in addition, uh, this past year, we've also given them all paid memberships into the St. Croix Archaeological Society. And one of the um, thoughts and kind of benefits to this is that in addition to training the students in a skill set, we want to make them super marketable when it comes to colleges. And the fact that you have students that not only participated and um, had jobs, uh, essentially working within the archaeological field, but are also members of an actual science society, really kind of sets them apart and um, makes them shining stars when it comes to the collegiate application process and being selected or not selected. Next slide. So one of the things with this project is um, each year I have conversations with our community partners. The idea is to keep building the project so that we're able to um, give the students the maximum amount of benefit of participating. So one of the things that has been identified is to expand the program longer. So initially, um, if we are able, provided everything goes well this year, the interns will have a week of training just by themselves. So we'll do intensive archeology span training with them. This will actually be on the artifact and um, analysis side. So we'll have more classes for them um, around identifying artifacts, being able to classify them. And just to kind of give you an introduction, um, during the week long program, all of the students actually get a very base level, but with this, it'll be a lot more intense with explaining. So ultimately, uh, they'll be able to help um, when it comes to cataloging and identifying the artifacts in the field, which will later be the artifacts that we enter into the DAX catalog. We also plan on giving them uh, technological uh, training. So teaching the students about photogrammetry and the basics of photogrammetry, because this is a very marketable skill that uh, quite a few of us in the archeology span world need people who can actually do this. Um, so introducing them to them and letting them get their feet wet with conducting uh, photogrammetry. And then the other idea is to increase the number of interns. Um, so one of the things that we've done year in is fundraise in order to pay the interns um, for these positions. So in the past, we've had four. The idea is to open it up where we can have um, up to as maybe six or seven interns uh, this coming summer as well. So this is just one initiative that we've done. Um, one of the others is doing a community archaeology day. We didn't want to be so insulated where the work that we were doing was just between our community partners and the students that we were working with. We wanted to expand it to the larger island. So one of the things that we did for the first time was actually have a community archaeology day where we opened up the site for people to come visit, learn what's being done on the estate, Little Princess, meet all of the archaeologists who are working there. But the highlight of the program was that the interns were the ones who were actually running the Community Archaeology Day. So they were the ones explaining the artifacts that were uncovered. They were the ones that were um, giving the tours of the archaeological excavations. So it 
allowed the students to actually shine and show all their skills off to everyone um, and to show that they um, really are learning and they're contributing to their own heritage and the interpretation of that heritage as well. So if you have any questions, I, I can answer any questions about the program at the end. And I'll go ahead and pass it over to Bill. All right, have we got our slide assistant available? Or did we have to restart our, um, our computer? Hi, I had to restart my computer. Oh my goodness, technical difficulties. It's all right, <laughs> Sorry about every that. day. My whole computer just died, but I'm back on. So That's um, all right. I missed the whole transition, but here I am. Okay, so we're gonna welcome Dr. Bill White as our next speaker who's going to be talking about um, the next steps for uh, research on St. Croix at St. George's State. Bill got his PhD from the University of Arizona in 2010. Uh, actually, I'm sorry, 2017. But before he did that, he spent many, many years working for cultural resource management firms across the West um, and has deep history, uh, deep work with field work uh, with CRM firms and also switching to academia to look at underrepresented communities, uh, both in the West and also in the Caribbean. So take it away, Bill. All right. Thank you for that introduction. Uh, I am Bill White, and I'm here at my house in Hercules, California, which is on unceded territory territory of the Muwekma Ohlone tribe. And uh, I just wanted to make sure I acknowledge that before we go any further. We're all around the world, so it's interesting to recognize where folks are at. Uh, yeah, so... Uh, I have been fortunate for the last three years to be working on St. Croix with my colleagues with the SBA, and we have spent that time uh, productively doing research at uh, the Estate Little Princess, as was mentioned before. We've got a really great program going on. Um, and in 2019, we were approached by people from the, uh, the Botanical Garden of the Virgin Islands on St. Croix. That's a not-for-profit, um, uh, botanical garden, but it's also an event space, and it is located on a former sugar plantation. And so some of the folks that were part of that organization approached us because they were interested in doing a community-based collaborative project along the lines of what we were doing at Estate Little Princess, but doing them at another plantation. And so our plans, of course, they've been uh, kind of shortened because of um, COVID and everything, but we do plan when we come back to St. Croix to transition from a state little princess to uh, the um, botanical gardens at St. George. So next slide, next slide, please. All right, as was mentioned before, we've spent years at a state little princess, which you can see is on the north shore of the island, and uh, St. George, uh, St. George Village Botanical Garden is in the southwestern quadrant of the island. And so, a couple of things to remember about this location is that. Um, it's on a different um, landform in a different part of the island. So um, it has a different uh, terrain, different soils, and a different hydrology. And so one of our main things that we'd like to do as far as archaeology is um, compare the results and the data that we're collecting at um, the Estate Little Princess to what we get at this other plantation elsewhere on the island. Next slide, please. Um, so the story of the St. George uh, plantation that would eventually become this botanical garden parallels uh, the history of a state little princess. In 1751, Danish investors get given a grant to start a small sugar plantation in this location. Uh, there's some historical documents that there may have been some sort of sugar growing operation in this location before then. And eventually it would grow to over 300 acres. So it ends up being uh, bigger than um, a state little princess. And its ownership history is a bit more complicated. So it's transferred several different times from different owners until, it, and in the 20th century, it became owned by several sugar companies. So it also has this um, uh, heritage of growing sugar for um, hundreds of years that spans the time period when there were enslaved African individuals on the island into the time when there are indentured servants and workers at this at this location. So in those ways, 
um, the kind of demographics and the, the function of the property itself is similar. But because it's a, in, uh, it's a larger um, property and it also had a larger group of enslaved individuals um, that uh, also over time transferred into a different kind of uh, historic property. It'll be interesting for us to do archeology span to try and compare the differences between these two locations because their history does, um, uh, uh, they do have enough variance that we'd like to see if our methods can uh, see if life was different on a larger plantation like this than it was on a smaller place like a state little princess. We know from, we're just starting our historical document uh, research, but we know that um, in the early 1800s, there were almost 180 individuals there on a um, large slave village, slave village that contained 33 uh, individual cabins. Now, just like a state little princess, this building was added to the National Register of Historic Places in 1986, and it has uh, many buildings that have been remodeled over the over time, but also extant archaeological architectural ruins that are connected to archaeological deposits. So, uh, in the National Register form that was filed in the uh, 1980s, they note that there's 13 slave houses and also a, a cemetery. Now, they have a cemetery of um, slave owners that's there, but uh, they also have a cemetery of enslaved persons on this property. The other thing that makes it different than a state little princess is there's a, um, a well-known um, prehistoric village that was excavated on this location. And so um, one of the things that we're really interested in is the change in land uh, activities that are taking place on this landscape between prehistoric people and folks during this plantation time period. And so uh, as, as was mentioned, folks, um, discovered this prehistoric archeological component, but they have also collected other artifacts associated with um, the uh, historical period when this was a plantation. So when this was, uh, when St. Croix was administered by the Danish kingdom, uh, there were antiquarians and amateur archeologists that went across the island that were Danish and they excavated several different sites and they took a lot of artifacts and um, the, all their notes and other things with them to these di different Danish archives. So one component of moving to St. George is to try and compile all this previous excavation information and all these other artifacts and try to use them as kind of a, you know, a guide as far as what has already been, what has already been done there and what we, uh, where we can pick up where they left off. So today, um, uh, the Estate Little Princess is managed by the Nature Conservancy as a nature preserve, whereas St. George Botanical Garden is an event center. And it uh, hosts several different cultural events, but it also has ongoing other kinds of activities like uh, um, music performances and yoga and you know other things that are going on all year round. So um, the, the use of this land in the present is also different even though its um, uh, origins in the um, sugar plantation era and the slave trade are the same. Okay, next slide, please. At St. George, we would like to continue the um, excellent collaboration that we've uh, been doing with uh, folks there on St. Croix, our Afrocrusian collaborators and partners, and the people there that administer the St. George Plantation, they're really receptive, and this is one of the main motivators for them to better connect with the community in which they're functioning. We'd also like to cooperate as much as we can with the property owners because they also would like to have some advice and some uh, um, some guidance on the archaeological collections that they already have, but also getting that data from previous excavations. Um, of course, our goal is always to um, better understand the life for enslaved African persons on, um, on St. Croix, but we'd also like to do everything that we can to continue our efforts of training the next generation of archaeologists, but also helping people on the island make a contribution to their own heritage and be active uh, um, creators of that. So because this is a different property, and as you can tell, it looks a little bit different, um, we are given some different opportunities at this location that we couldn't necessarily do at a state little princess. As uh, Dr. Jones mentioned, photogrammetry is a really transferable skill for young people these days. And the way that the um, landscape has been maintained here, it's more conducive to creating 3D models of buildings. 
and uh, uh, because more of the forest has been cleared away, it's also more conducive for 3D uh, landscape um, renderings and models of the landscape. So this will be uh, slightly easier for us to be able to teach students how to um, create these different models because there's not as many obstructions. But also because so much of this is cleared, it also gives us the potential possibly for some non-invasive survey like uh, magnetometry or um, gradiometry work. And then we would like to also, because we're using similar methods and cataloging artifacts in similar ways and describing the soil similarly, we'd like to compare our results with what we've already been uh, creating at Estate Little Princess. So that with that, that's all I've got. Um, and I will hand off the microphone. Excellent. <clears throat> Thanks, Bill. Um, Next, I'd like to introduce Ms. Gabrielle Miller. She's a PhD student at the University of Tulsa studying African diaspora archeology. span Her current research project engages the expressions and legacies of freedom and resistance in an 18th and 19th century free black community in St. Croix, Vir US Virgin Islands. She does this in collaboration with the historic, the heritage practitioners, artisans, historians, and descendants of that community. Uh, which we'll hear about next. Uh, another extension of her work is with the organization uh, Diving with a Purpose as an instructor candidate and in Youth Diving with a Purpose as an educator and mentor. Uh, Gabrielle is also a DAX NEH fellow and she has been uh, with us in the DAX lab studying material culture uh, before the pandemic and she'll be back studying with us after the pandemic as will Dr. Fluellen. Um, so, Take it away, Gabrielle. Thank you, Jillian. Um, and thank you everybody else for your very good overview of the work that you've been doing for years that I've had the privilege of coming into, um, you know, starting this PhD program at the University of Tulsa was a direct result of the work that uh, Society of Black Archaeologists are doing at a state little princess. And I am um, coming into this next generation of continued progress based off of what they've been doing there. So I'm really grateful to be a part of this continuing conversation. Um, so today I wanna to talk about a program, a project that is not only um, part of my own dissertation research, but really was started at the behest of the work that the community had already been doing um, and that my work can be used as a tool to engage in an ongoing process of what um, Chant uh, has been coining a term of transformative placemaking. So the work that I've been able to engage in, uh, which started in 2019, um, is really at the intersection of art, archaeology, and community. And so I'm going to get a little bit into um, chant and why this area that I'm working in, which is different than um, the Nature Conservancy at Estate Little Princess and different than um, the Botanical Gardens, why the area I'm working in is called Freedom City and what archaeology can do there. Slide. Um, oh, go ahead and slide. So the background of Frederickstead, which is on the far west end of the island, um, is that St. Croix has a rich heritage of resistance and revolution and liberation. And so some quotes here, direct quotes from laborers that were a part of the transformative process of revolting in order to gain emancipation. And then after emancipation, um, revolting once again in order to gain labor reform and not have to continue slavery under the idea of contract labor. And so this is not just part of St. Croix history, but this is the history of Frederickstead, um, which is also known colloquially as Freedom City. Slide, please. Um, and so Free Gut is a neighborhood within the uh, town of Frederickstead, and it was established in 1753. Um, it's known as a historic free black town, although it was not only um, occupied by those who were free black individuals, but this was truly um, an intersection of liberatory figures and folks that were able to use their freedom in collaboration with the enslaved community um, and other collaborators in order to gain and maintain their freedom um, throughout time, not just 
as we think of within a traditional colonial period, but even far into um, the Harlem Renaissance and to today. So we're really looking at a history of resistance from 1753 through um, the Harlem Renaissance with homes such as Frank Crossway um, and Samuel Jackson, Ashley Totten, a lot of these large figures that we think of as um, catalysts for social change in New York were born and raised in um, Frigga as well. And so um, that is the rich background and heritage of this, um, this neighborhood that I'm working that is really a three block radius, but with such a central space for change. Slide please. Um, the excavations that took place came out of a uh, NEA, um, a National Endowment of the Arts grant that chant the organization Crucian uh, Heritage and Nature Tourism received uh, to take this property, which was the first black owned property in Free Gut, um, and convert it into a museum space and also a place for uh, artisans to live and maintain the property and create art that is influenced by the history of this space. And so on the by the request of Chant, I was able to come in and do a pilot study and archeological project um, in hopes to get this on the national register um, and to study the, the neighborhood in a more full and holistic way. Um, but the way that looks doesn't necessarily look like a, tra a traditional archeological project. It looks like something that comes from the community and the community's um, goals and is rooted in that. And archeology span is hopefully coming alongside as a tool to support that and investigate through um, the community's needs and values. So this original property, uh, it was owned by, first by John Woodjet. Um, who is a free man of color, a free black afro um, and er, owned that from 1777 to 1779. Um, since that point, that it has been continuously occupied by free black folks, um, enslaved folks, and also um, even some white individuals. And so that gets a little bit into the complex nature of this space and archeologically, is it possible to tease out and understand um, the snapshot of a free black community in a space that is so um, complex in nature. And so this, because there have not been any previous excavations in this area, it is, it is serving as a study to understand whether or not we can ask some of the questions we're asking and answer that um, through the means that we are. And I think that, that we can. Slide, please. Um, so Chant as an organization, um, prior to me joining their project, their project is, uh, was really created to meet the community's needs to establish habitable buildings since the buildings in this area are um, under disrepair, not only from hurricanes, um, but also from uh, just neglect over time, not the inability to occupy these spaces for financial reasons, um, and then also protect from the rampant gentrification that's happening on the island. Um, and so the, this project will be used to activate these spaces and recenter them within the history and the current dynamic of um, Friga as a community. Slide, please. And so there's really a four tier model that they're using to engage in this. They want to use art and design to be used as a catalyst for community engagement, rejuvenation, um, mentorship as a way of safeguarding ancestral knowledge, vocational training um, really is really diverse. Um, lately they've been working uh, more in woodworking, but they have also uh, worked with um, historic preservationists to learn how to uh, repair these buildings and in a way that's consistent with um, Secretary of Interior standards um, and purchase these buildings in order to maintain more control over that. Um, and community revitalization, safeguard the space for local residents to fight things like gentrification and make it a space that takes into account the issues of low income residency um, and make this a space where affordable housing can take place. Slide, please. 
So how archaeology is a tool in engaging those goals um, has started, like I said, in 2019. Um, and our initial goals coming in were to um, research this enslaved and free and self-emancipated narrative, um, address a void in historiography and in archaeology um, of this space and area, look at ways that we define resistance and redefine resistance and placemaking, um, and impact involve multiple marginalized and un underrepresented communities. Slide, please. Um, and so this has, this, I, I think that the most um, transformative way archeology span has been used is to integrate rather than relying on people who already understand archeology, span know archeology, span we worked with the artisans who have already been doing this work with chant. And um, during that summer, I trained those artisans and we worked together to create a holistic, um, a holistic from start to end understanding of how to do archeology span in this space. So this context is very different. It's urban, um, although relatively undisturbed and we were able to start at excavation, work on sorting, um, hopefully in the future work on teaching laboratory analysis, but being able to work with the artists that are already engaging in this space, already engage with the history that is theirs, and then be able to add this component of them digging up and interpreting this archeological space rather than letting somebody else do that for them is really important to making this a sustainable project um, over time and hopefully into the future. So even though I am able to engage with this for the purpose of a dissertation, the goal really, as it was a project that started before me is to uh, make it more sustainable into the future and address the inequality that exists between who gets to do archeology span on the island um, and moving forward with that. Slide, please. Um, another main component and goal of this project, like I said, scientific training, breaking academic barriers and training community members. And also in this photo, you'll see some of the HBCU interns from Estate Little Princess. So we're all also um, bridging this uh, narrative of, we have folks that are working on the east end of the island, and now they're also getting in the opportunity to engage with a different history of the island, a different context on the island, um, and create a more holistic narrative and connect these spaces together, which DAX also plays a huge role in being able to um, compare these spaces where we weren't able to do previously and have a common um, language and able to interpret that from. Um, number two, communal interpretation. So there are many ways to interpret a space. And as you know, you can only dig something up once. And so centering that in the community um, sort of safe, safeguards that initial look at a history, being able to remain within the community and being able to reflect those values. Um, and ongoing cultural stewardship, um, integrating archeology span with existing efforts. Um, like I said, this is, I think that work within the Af African diaspora is becoming something that a lot of people are focusing on during the time of Black Lives Matters. Um, but as Ayana mentioned earlier, there are very few of us matriculating into the field. And so we want to create something that is sustainable um, because we are the perpetual stewards of our history. Um, and this is one of the ways I think we can engage in that. Slide, please. Um, and part of the way that we try to establish um, what those values are that I talked about and continue to re-engage with that is to have ongoing community planning sessions. Um, so far, because of restrictions with university travel and COVID, you know, a lot of these things have been put on hold, but the structure of that is to continuously have community planning sessions in order to root that and keep it rooted in um, the stories that people are interested in knowing more about. And so see, these are some of the questions that we asked and the answers reveal that um, they're both cohesive and um, individual ideas of what stories people wanna know, but the most important things were to make this more accessible um, and make it something that people can be involved with in every level. So not just, 
in archaeology, but how do we integrate um, interv ethnographic interviews? How do we integrate archival information? How do we integrate um, continued storytelling? How do we integrate oral history? And so um, that's really where the value of this lies personally for me. And I think within the community is if it's not centered in these things, um, it's not really reaching uh, its full potential. Slide, please. Um, and so what, what we hope this communal storytelling framework can look like is that we can focus on things of in this space, what is a sense of space, not just in this, not just in the past, but how does the past um, inform sense of place now? Um, how can we communally curate things? And so um, DAX is a very big part of this, of understanding how we handle the material culture and assess the material culture and preserve it in a way where we can continue telling stories from it um, through analysis, but also integrating that with stories, photos, documents, um, and letting that be a sort of living, breathing archive of how the community is viewing it in accessing material culture in the space. Um, and accessibility far beyond a, a document that is a dissertation essentially or um, publishing in scientific journals, how do we increase interactive avenues for presenting this? Um, and I think Ayana mentioned earlier, we are st we are all storing our artifacts at our various institutions, but desiring to create a place on island where those things can live um, and be preserved for the generations there is really um, of the most importance. Slide. So so yeah, conclusions with this project um, really has shown that archaeologically, this is a really viable place for archaeology to come up beside uh, community narratives. Um, and there are some challenges. This is a slow process. History is slow, but our, our um, academic um, avenues don't always allow for something to take that long. But how, but in each project, taking into account the time that it takes to build something that's lasting, um, creatively approaching things and maybe pushing uh, methodologies that existed before. Adapting has been really large since COVID has really challenged um, how we are able to integrate with each other and to um, push things forward. Unlearning a lot of the things that we've learned in this space, you know, archaeology is inherently colonial. And so unlearning some of that colonialism and how we talk about history is um, just one of the most important foundations of this work. Um, and having commitment to self-reflexivity and transparency through this process. And so hopefully we see this not only as um, part of an existing narrative of how we engage with history, but hopefully a way to change how we engage with archaeology and history going forward. So slide, please. Um, and so Frandel Gerard, who's the director of Chant, um, said that the power of the place will be charged by the historical narrative and the structures will be activated by the community for positive transformation. So that really is a reflection of the goals of this project and um, hopefully going forward, we'll really see that blossom and develop. Slide. And these are our sponsors. Thank you so much. Excellent. Thank you. All right, we can, we're gonna bring everybody back onto screen. Um, we've got about 10 minutes for questions. And so I would say to the audience, the live audience out there, please, uh, please write in if you've got questions and we'll pull them out of the chat. But I've got some questions for the group. Um, and before we, we start, I know, at the beginning, I was having a lot of feedback. So my introduction was a little stilted. And I, I think you've probably heard in each of these presentations how their work connects to DAX. Um, but just as a little recap, ultimately the artifacts from Estate Little Princess, St. George and Frigga will end up going online through DAX.org so that the public has free uh, access to all of the materials that are excavated from these sites, from field records and photographs and maps to every single uh, bit of information about every single artifact recovered from these sites. So it really gives, uh, the idea with DAX is to give scholars and the public 
the ability to put their own interpretations on these sites uh, as they see fit and to do large scale comparative work uh, across sites of enslavement and freedom uh, in North America and the Caribbean. So um, let's see, my first question, actually I'm going to, I know Alex has to run pretty soon. So I wanted to, uh, it's a question for Alex and, and Gabrielle. Um, can you talk more about uh, communal interpretation and how that works? So what techniques do the two of you use to teach students and community members history and material culture so they have enough of a background to then bring their own experiences to um, community interpretation, to helping them interpret the sites you're working on. Um, and so, yeah. So I work directly with Christian youth. Um, so it's having conversations about family, having conversations about their lived environment, um, you know, kind of moving back and forth every day, what they see, how they interact. Um, their actual food ways, their culture, their way of doing life, and then taking that and applying it to uh, the artifacts. Because one of the things that I explain is they come with innate knowledge that I don't have. Mm -hmm. And that knowledge of being raised there, living there, uh, breathing the everyday, experiencing the uh, seasons and the environment and what takes place, um, they actually come with way more knowledge that I think sometimes they give themselves credit for because Mostly as adults, we discredit uh, youth and we kind of always say that you're a child being a child's place. But this is the first time where I'm empowering them and saying that, uh, no, no, you're actually going to do the active work of interpreting. And as we do the process of excavating, I'm talking about context and look what you're finding. And, you know, we've already done kind of base level understanding of materials. So they already have kind of little dates stuck in their head. So as they find things and they find artifacts, they're able to kind of start to make uh, those connections and kind of those interpretations to start with. So that's more so how I handle it um, when dealing with the youth. Yeah, and um, I think that I'm so lucky to have found a partner that really understands that everything in that space is an integration of culture and history. And so, you know, some of the projects that Chan was doing already was working with a local artist, Lavon Bell, for example, and they were taking some of the gingerbread architectural structures and the artists were learning not only how to recreate those structures, but to also create their own designs based off of their lived experiences. And so there's already this installation of, I'm always, I'm not separate from history. I am of this land and I'm always engaging with history just by living and just by being a part of it. And so being able to have those folks in the field, there's almost this um, natural connection between the questions that are being asked while you're going through don't necessarily look like, um, sort of the ones that we we're trained to ask off of the bat, but look like, oh, I remember my grandmother talking about this. It looks very intergenerational. Um, it looks like something that is connected to story often. And so um, something that I'd like to do in the future is integrate, you know, like Alex is working with the youth and the youth is a component that's missing um, in Friga, even though it's so natural. And so how can we then connect folks and put this all together and continue? Because really we're talking about generations. And so um, any way that we talk about it as in context of I am part of a bigger whole and then what I do now will be part of a reflection of the future. Um, that's sort of how we move forward with that. And it's just, it's kind of a natural flow, but it also is set with intention. Okay, all right, excellent. Um, Bill also has to leave soon. So I have a question for you, Bill, about field work on Saint, uh, on Saint, uh, at St. Saint George Estate. Um, and will you be investigating spaces similar to those that you've been excavating at Estate Little Princess or will you have a different focus? And then another just sort of fun question is, what methods do you like to, to teach the most to your students? Um, I know I really love teaching how to lay out grids and do total stations and stratigraphy and material culture. So it sounds like you might have a, a little love of photogrammetry, but yeah, I wanna, wanna see what you like to do there. <laughs> I do love photogrammetry. I mean, that's great. But I think that uh, excavating in, in layers and showing students how to identify naturally occurring layers or not just arbitrary intervals, you know, that's kind of the key because you're putting together artifacts 
and soil texture and all that stuff. And it isn't easy. So, um, you know, I think that that is the one thing that if we get into these really complicated contexts with a lot of different pits and features and different layers and stuff, floor context inside buildings and stuff. I mean, those are the kind of things that those are really fun for folks to try and figure out, you know, okay, this came first and then that came next. And, you know, those, those things are, they're, they're the kind of, um, you know, uh, in the moment, real skills that people, you know, it's experiential learning. You can't, there is no simulation. There's no model that we can make that's going to show us that experience of being able to identify multiple different floor layers. So that's the one thing that I'm really excited if we get into one of those ones. Um, but then at St. George, you know, really the biggest change to our uh, research design is excavating at a place that we know there was a significant Native American village. I mean, there was a prehistoric site that's been excavated several times in the 19th century and into the 20th century. And folks have identified this thing that's, you know, a significant component of this place. However, the excavations on the prehistoric component are away from where the enslaved village is at. However, you know, it's along a water course. It's on a location that would have had a lot of resources. So um, trying to make sure that we carefully identify if we can, uh, you know, that signature of that pre-contact period. I mean, that's the one thing that we really have to account for at St. George compared to a state little princess. Yeah, that's that's going to be super exciting to watch that unfold for sure. Uh, you know, a number of other sites that we collaborate on in the Caribbean have uh, prehistoric components and sort of understanding the long term trajectory of settlement at these sites is uh, is is fascinating. Uh, we actually have a couple questions from the chat now. So uh, Marjorie asks, Marjorie from Tulsa asks, uh, she'd like to know the starting age of the students that you work with. So I partner with the Caribbean Boys and Girls Club. So they help me identify the youth. And the wonderful part is there is an East and West division. So literally my students are from the whole island. So it's not being selective. Um, but the youngest I've had to date was 12 years old and it goes all the way up to 17. All right, excellent, mm -hmm. great. Um, and then we have a question from Jay who wants to know how you communicate the importance of communal storytelling to Crucians. Um, yeah, so I don't convey the importance of storytelling at all uh, because it's already there, um, you know, going back to before we were brought here, there's the strong tradition of being a griot is instilled deeply in the community. And, um, you know, I see archaeology as a tool of adding to a story that is already being told um, and that it's limited in that perspective, in which the ways that we tell stories um, is, is deeply connected to material, but also transcends material. And so, um, you know, I think if there wasn't uh, an importance in storytelling already there, I don't think archaeology would um, be a component in being part of that effort. So, yeah, really lucky. Um, I know we all have our favorite artifact types as archaeologists that we love to discover. Uh, and I noticed in the chat lots of positive comments about the work that you are all doing with uh, educating uh, high school students, you know, secondary high school students. Uh, so I want to ask you guys, what do you see as some of their favorite artifacts? When you're working with them in the field, what really grabs them uh, as you're excavating? I'll jump in. Nails. I think nails are like by far the easiest thing to teach and the easiest thing to grab. So I love it because literally there's a whole conversation about, ooh, this is a rot nail. You know, this is... <laughs> So they, they, you know, they. Alex, what is a rot nail? <laughs> I think a rot nail might not know. <laughs> a handmade nail. So there's this this whole. They instantly feel just off of the nail lesson alone, like official archaeologists, and it it like immediately activates the scientists in them. So as we're excavating, um, they get super excited behind nails and the fact that they can kind of flex. Um, I. I I have one cute scenario where they were working alongside the college students and like one of the high school students while in the lab, you know, proceeded to inform the college student what type of nail it was and around what time it said to because they realized that the college student didn't know it. And so it was like their ability to show off like, hey, 
I really know what I'm doing and you know, I could be an archeologist. So nails are always it for me. That's excellent. That's great. Um, and then that just, we only have a few more minutes left, but I did want to sort of a broader question uh, for Ayana and for Gabrielle about the material culture that you are finding on these enslaved and free, um, from these enslaved and free contexts. And maybe just talk really quickly about what you're finding material culture wise and what's that, what, how you're interpreting that um, and how the community is interpreting those material remains. Yeah, absolutely. So just adding on to Alex's point around like what artifacts have been really exciting for students. A lot of our college age students are really excited just about the sheer difference or variety in ceramics that are being recovered from the estate little princess. Um, during the Danish occupation period, there were open ports on St. Croix. So you have a wide variety of European goods coming in and out of this particular um, island. And that shows up in the enslaved village area. So we're finding a wide variety of ceramics that even were surprising for um, our DAX collaborators. I remember when we first came to DAX and both Jillian and Beth Elizabeth Bulwark were like, wow, did not expect to find just like early French ceramics and things like yeah. that, as well as just the wide variety of um, Afro-Caribbean wares that were coming across at the site too. So that's really exciting for us to sort of peel deeper into to sort of think about exchange, to think about um, consumer practices um, on the island and among the enslaved Africans that were there. Yeah. And, um, you know, like Ayana said about having this large ceramic volume, it is the same um, in free guts so far. And so we're, you know, I think we sent you a photo, Jillian, and you said, this is Bavarian porcelain. And we're like, what? <laughs> and, you know, it's, about, it's really about this open port context, but, but what are, but also what spaces are we finding mm -hmm. this in and why is it there? And so, you know, eventually I think the goal is to have this comparison between a state little princess, between Frigga and looking at those ceramic um, types that we're finding. And is there a difference in what we're finding in this like really um, diverse range of things? And, and I think also among the folks that I was working with, you know, there's already this love of ceramic decorative genre among folks using um, what they call, you know, this transfer print wear, what they call Cheney wear, um, and fashioning that into jewelry and also reclaiming that colonial narrative. And so um, LaVon Bell, who I mentioned earlier, I think Ayana, she sent you a photo of um, the some transfer print that depicted um, folks that were black, which we haven't seen much of often. And so um, I think, you know, for me, I'm really personally excited about what genres were people choosing then to have in their households and does it reflect um, representation? You know, what does that look like? And I think that that'd be fun to explore. Oh yeah, exactly. Well, I can't wait to continue exploring all of these questions with the four of you in the coming years. Uh, I think we're all really looking forward to the end of the pandemic when we can get back together to look at both dirt and artifacts uh, as a group. So it's, we've gone a little past two, but Thank you all very much and um, keep up the amazing work. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.